Good evening, everyone. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Catherine Biggs Craft, and I'm the Executive Director and Curator of the St. John Jewish Historical Museum in St. John, New Brunswick. And I would like to welcome everyone here this evening for the fifth installment in our lecture series, Travels to Israel. In order to make this presentation enjoyable for everyone, um, I would ask that you mute your microphones. Um, if you don't know how to do that, it should uh, be at the bottom left of your screen if you're on a computer. Um, for the best viewing and to see the images which are going to be shared, you can adjust your the way you view the event by clicking view in the upper right hand corner of your screen and choosing speaker view. Um, if you wish to make a comment or ask a question, we encourage you to do so by using the chat button at the bottom center of your zoom screen or you can raise your hand. Um, I will share your comments and questions after the presentation and you will also have the opportunity to interact with our speaker yourself. I will note that this lecture is being recorded and it will be shared at a later date on our St. John Jewish Historical Museum YouTube channel. And once the lecture is available, we will also send those registered for the lecture a link to that page. This lecture series is part of our new museum exhibit, The View from Damascus Gate Travels to Israel 1855 to 2018. This exhibition has been two years in the making from the initial meeting in August 2019 with Cassie Stanley, who introduced us to the photographs taken in the Holy Land by her great great grandfather, the Reverend William Mead Jones, up to the present time. In addition to these photographs, we have artifacts that the Jones family brought back with them. And to connect the story to St. John, the exhibit includes stories of travels collected from our museum members and friends. We extend our thanks to all who have shared their stories. Each one represents a different and unique perspective. Funding for the creation of the ex exhibit was provided by the Exhibition Renewal and Museum Activity Support Program through the Archaeology and Heritage Branch of the Province of New Brunswick. And funding for this lecture series was provided by the Greater St. John Community Foundation. And without their support, none of this would have been possible. Thank you. This evening's presenter is Anna Morneau. Anna was born in Israel and lived in an ultra-Orthodox neighborhood in Jerusalem. She has a Bachelor of Education with a teaching certificate in English as a second language and a master's degree in learning man management systems. After immigrating to St. John, she joined the Newcomer Connections at the YMCA of Greater St. John, where she develops curriculum and online courses. Her passion for teaching also includes teaching English as a second language, yoga, and Hebrew school for the children in the Jewish community. So at this point, Anna, I'm going to turn it over to you and for you to share your life journey. Thank you. Um, so thank you everybody for coming and joining me today uh, on a Sunday evening. Um, Thank you, Catherine, for giving me this opportunity to delve back into some parts of my life that I haven't thought about in probably more than two decades. So it was quite interesting. Um, I think it was a, a healing therapeutic process for me. And uh, it, it's important. I feel like it's very important for me, from my perspective, to share this and say it out loud for myself and especially for my mother um, cause, uh, she made Aliyah from England, uh, from Manchester, uh, from, uh, religious, um, Jewish, uh, family. And she came to Israel as a Zionist and for her, oh, I'm going to quote, uh, mocking her existence because she made Aliyah and the generation down one, and I made Yerida, which means going down or leaving Israel. So I really felt like I needed to not justify, but really explain uh, all the events that led to this decision, this big life decision that I made uh, to immigrate to Canada and landed in New Brunswick in Rossay. Uh, so before I really get started, um, I feel like it's very important for me to clear this, that everything that I'm going to say today uh, doesn't represent the Israeli society, doesn't represent any um, culture or any type of uh, 
socio-democratic view. This is really my perspective from my eyes. I try to be as subjective as possible and show all sides of the story. But since this is a story that is about to explain why I moved, if everything was great, I wouldn't have moved. So it's more focused on the negative just because it is trying to explain the reasoning of leaving a country that I was born and raised in. Uh, so um, by doing so, I tried not to offend anybody, but if I do at some point, that definitely wasn't my intention. Uh, I love Israel. I think it's a great place. I think the people there are, are amazing. And um, the land is beautiful and so rich of culture and history. Uh, so that is what I wanted to state, first of all, before I go into sharing my um, experiences. And because they're my experiences, um, it's definitely not what other Israelis might have felt and their reason to moving would be completely different than mine. So I don't want anybody to generalize uh, any of my reasonings and trying to project that on other people. So again, this is my story, only my story. I had quite a unique experience uh, from where I came from. I uh, don't know anybody that moved here uh, that came from Jerusalem or came from a, a Orthodox neighborhood or came from an Anglo-Saxon parent, to be honest. So really it is just my story. <laughs> and I'm going to emphasize this as much as I can. And I really apologize. I try to leave politics away, but some of the reasons for moving were a little political. So I had to bring that up too. I try to be very honest and true to myself and, and what I liked or didn't like um, that made me want to move. And as Catherine said before, if you have any questions, you will be able to ask me um, at the end, or I won't be able to really see your hand raised while I'm speaking, um, since I am speaker view, so I can't see anybody's faces, so I can focus on my presentation. Uh, but if you do have something to say, you can feel free to interrupt me if it's really urgent, or you think you won't, you're not going to remember afterwards, or you just want me to clarify, or if I'm speaking too fast. So yes, um, I'm gonna start with um, my grandparents. So every story has a love story, usually every, every good story. And my love story starts from my parents, but before I talk about them, I wanna talk about my grandparents. Uh, so my grandparents from my father's side, if some of you have ever heard uh, the term Sephardim or Mizrahi, uh, these are usually Jews from Western Asia or North Africa Jews, and they're referred to as Sfaladim. Some of you might know it from the prayer book because there are different types of uh, nosach, which means different versions of the prayer book that are different um, tunes, even different lyrics in certain um, holidays are completely different. Uh, so that is one reason why I'm bringing this up, that there were Sephardim, because uh, it was a major, major uh, difference that I felt in my home. Uh, again, maybe some other people don't have any significance to this fact, but for me, it was a crucial fact that my grandparents from my father's side were Sephardim. My grandmother was from Algiers, so she spoke French. She was Algiers, it's very close to Morocco, so she was everything that you can imagine of a very Moroccan kind of European woman. Um, she was uh, raised actually by nuns in a certain part of France that was very close to, um, uh, what's it called? <laughs> One minute, I'll remember. Um, Switzerland, sorry. So her parents were from Algeria, Morocco, but she was actually raised more in the border between France and Switzerland. So she was raised by nuns, but they were very traditional Jewish family. And my father, uh, my father's um, father, so my grandfather was uh, from Spain, half of them from Spain, Gerusfad, when they released a lot of Jews from Spain and Syria. So they both uh, lived in Israel and had my father. They were born, uh, he was born with his brothers and sister. He had three brothers and one sister. I'm saying he had because he passed away when I was 15. Um, gonna get to that part, but I was in grade nine. 
and they lived in the shuk. I don't know if some of you have ever heard this term shuk. It's like a huge market in the heart of Jerusalem. Uh, so they actually lived on top of a pita bread factory. I'm going to show you the picture later uh, exactly where they lived. So they lived on top of a store in the shuk, in the heart of the shuk. Um, yeah, so my grandfather had very strong roots from a dynasty of Levy family. My dad's name was Levy and from very um, religious uh, family in Spain. And this is all my dad's side. Of course, the food is a big, huge difference, as you can see, the taste, the flavors, uh, but also a lot of the culture. And my mom is a real Ashkenazi, European Jew. Uh, she was born in Manchester, like I said, in England. And her grandfather was, was from Poland and her grandmother was from Romania, Lithuania. My grandmother's father was actually a rabbi. Uh, so they were all from very religious um, backgrounds. And um, yeah, so I'm gonna get back to the differences here, but there was a, a lot of clashes between the two families when my parents were wanted to get together and get married and raise a family. It wasn't very accepted at those times, at least where they were from, that a mixed, a mix like that would be possible and it would be accepted. More from my mother's side than I would say from my dad's side, um, from my experience. It was more them that rejected anything that had to do with my father and his heritage. Um, so my parents uh, actually fell in love when my mother came here here came there to Israel on a Shnat Kibbutz. If some of you have ever heard of a Kibbutz, um, I wrote down here a little bit about what a Kibbutz is. It's a settlement. Most of them were agriculture, but uh, it has changed dramatically. It started off as a social democratic kind of uh, everybody is equal. There's no classes, no social classes. Uh, everybody works together, eats together. The children go to a separate room with children, no matter who their parents are, they're raised together as kids. And um, my mom came there to uh, volunteer for a year and she met my father and they fell in love. And after that, uh, she brought him to England to meet the parents, which said no, and uh, she didn't listen. And they had my brother and me in a Haredi ultra-Orthodox neighborhood in Jerusalem called Bet Israel, and it's in Mea Sharim. So if any of you heard of Mea Sharim, it's a very, very religious neighborhood where you don't see anybody else other than different types of Haredi people. Um, these are Haredi people, not just uh, Datim, not just religious, but only Haredi. Uh, this is just... An example of what it looked like, this is actually the neighborhood Bet Israel outside uh, the apartment where my parents had my brother and me. And um, after that, after they had my brother and me, they moved to a different neighborhood that was a little bit more of a mix. It was also a very religious neighborhood, um, but it was more of a mix with different types of streams of religion. Um, so what my dad did, he had a butcher shop in the Shuk, which is where his parents lived in the heart of Jerusalem. So he was a butcher. And uh, I don't really think that that was a, the right job for him. He was very sensitive. He actually loved animals. I feel like this job didn't really work well with his mental health and his um, personality, but that's what he did do. This is not my dad. This is just a picture that I found from a place where my dad had his butcher shop in the Shuk at the time. Um, so that's what he did. And he also wrote Stam. Uh, so I do have a Megillah that he wrote for me that I'll show you next in the next slide. Uh, so that's writing special, um, Torah uh, in a different type of ink and using a feather and using the special um, skin of a cow. So um, the, scow the cow's skin that they used as a paper. Uh, so it's very, very special and unique and everything about it was a whole ceremony, uh, making it, writing it, buying the stuff for it. I was lucky enough to be able to be involved in, in buying and finding and the whole process of it. Um, uh, my, my father really included me in all of that. Uh, so I was really fortunate to be able to do that with him. 
My mother worked at the joint. So she was uh, a grant writer. She always worked for nonprofit organizations. Till now, she's still working as that. Um, and uh, yeah, so she worked in a place called Binyanehoma, which is what I have over here. It's also in Jerusalem. Um, it was actually called Massachusetts Trade Office at the time when I was a child, but then she moved to different type of uh, grant writing for um, asking for money for different types of schools in Israel. Uh, so yeah, like I wrote down here, I do have a Megillah, which is this one. This is the one that my father wrote for me. I still remember when I was uh, uh, 12, so I had my bat mitzvah and uh, my dad took me to Masharim, uh, that neighborhood that I uh, was born in, where was the easiest place to find these cases and uh, the Megillah, the klaf, we call it klaf. I'm not really sure what it's called in English, but it had also the special thread that you needed to use in order to connect these pages together in the ink. Um, and he told me while he was buying this, he told me that this would be my inheritance and he wants me to choose uh, the case that I feel that is the nicest one and he will dedicate it for me and make it for me. Uh, so um, it is very precious and I still have it in my closet here at home. Uh, I do remember that this process was very agonizing for my father because he was kind of a perfectionist and he wanted each and every page to start with Hamelech. So as you can see, maybe here it's a little bit small, but every, sorry, every page has Hamelech on it and it goes like that till the end. Um, for some reason he read in the Kabbalah or somewhere that he read in the Talmud that it's meant to be more special if there is um, a scroll like that, a Megillah that starts with Hamelech in each page. Uh, this is a mezuzah that he wrote. Uh, he gave me the mezuzah, but I loved it so much. So I just put it in a frame. These are my parents, my father and my mother when they visited my mom's family in England, uh, when they just uh, met each other. And he liked uh, smoking a pipe, so that's why I put it. <laughs> so now I'm gonna move to the biggest portion probably, uh, which is Harnoff, the neighborhood that I mostly remember because where I was born, I don't really remember. I was really young. We moved when I was probably less than three. Uh, and we actually spent most of our life, my young, younger uh, childhood in this neighborhood called Harnoff which means uh, mountain view. And it did have magnificent views in this place. Uh, it was on a mountain, so it was beautiful. Lots of trees close to the Jerusalem forest. Um, they had afterwards another three sisters other than me. So we are five in the family. And uh, I went to this school over here, which was a girl's school only, of course. Uh, you had to wear skirts, no pants were allowed, or no shirts that were not covering your elbows. Skirts had to cover your knees, uh, so very uh, religious. And uh, the only difference was it wasn't this type of religious. It was more the Z uh, national Zionist. So it's called the Tilumi, but I'm not sure if a lot of you have ever heard the the term Dati Lumi, Dati means religious, Lumi means national. So it's like a Zionut, uh, Zionism, very religious, but very Zionist, uh, kind of ingrained inside, even poisoned, I would say, they poison you for being a Zionist about how you need to save your country and, and um, conquer your country and be in the army. So everybody that is a Dati Lumi goes to really good um, troops in the army. It's very important to be uh, very active in the army and not just going to be a cook. Like It's kind of a competition that you have of where is your kid going to go to the army. It's very different than this. So I wanted you to see that in this neighborhood, we had different types of religious uh, people. There were anti-Zionists and there were highly Zionists in this neighborhood. And it was very, very obvious which stream you were identifying with because of the color of your yarmulke, if it was knitted, if it was velvet, uh, the color of your cape, sometimes even the color of your sash, because there are breast lives that have different sashes and uh, there's the Boston Haredi that have white capes. And so everything there is very visible if you're different and if you, what kind of religion you belong to and it's significant 
in so many ways to so many people in this neighborhood. Uh, so <laughs> I put a picture here of if some of you know what that is, it's a mikveh. And the reason why I put it is because when I was trying to look back at my life as a child in Harnov, the biggest memory I had was uh, walking to school because I used to walk to school from one of the houses that we had, the apartments. It's very rare to have a house there. And uh, there were lots of steps that I had to go down and there was always this really strong smell of the mikveh. Mm. It got to the point that I was almost addicted to that smell. I loved that smell. I used to look forward to smelling that. I don't know if it's chlorine or what exactly, but something about that smell that I really liked. <coughs> Pardon me, I'm just gonna have a sip of water. So that's just something that I used to have and it was so accessible, but here is so not, so. <clears throat> I apologize. So that is probably a big, big difference that I, I noticed that growing up as a kid, these were the images, these were the faces, these were the people that I, I saw around me. Um, a lot of that notion of religious, different types of religious, Ashkenazi, Sephardi, um, secular, old, ultra-Orthodox, and all of that. And I went to this school, it was uh, from grade one to grade eight. So there wasn't like a middle school at that time. There was just an elementary and then high school. So I did this until I was uh, in grade um, eight. So I was 14 and then 15, I moved to grade nine to another place. It's called uh, Ulpena, which is basically like a yeshiva for boys, only it's for girls. So it was also religious and also girls only, but the difference was I had to take a bus and I had to go outside of Harnov and into the city center. Um, so before I talk about my high school experiences, I took some photos here for my brother. Actually, my brother went to take some photos for me of places that we both remembered. <coughs> my brother is just four years older than me. so. We have very similar experiences. I have one sister that's under me a year and a half, but she's very ill. So she doesn't really have any recollection of any of this. And then I have another sister that's three years younger and one that's five years younger. So kind of like, um, I wouldn't say the sandwich, but somewhere there in the middle. My brother is older than me. And then I do have three sisters that are younger. So he was very nice to go to that apartment that we lived in and take photos of some things that I remember that are very um, important in my uh, childhood. So he reminded me, I forgot about it, that I used to be very, very passionate and eager about this youth movement, this youth group that's called Ezra. It's a religious uh, youth group, not like the scouts, because it was <clears throat> not so much about uh, building tents and things like that. It was more about learning the Torah and loving the country and knowing your heritage. So it was more ingrained in that way in the youth group. But I used to go every Shabbat and every Tuesday. And we used to do Havdalah there and we used to do um, Shacharit and we used to do Mincha and Arvit and all of those prayers. And of course, if you ate, then you had to do Blakat Amazon. There was all of that in there, but I loved it because it was more of um, a community for me. I really felt that that was my place. These were my people and I felt comfortable in that, uh, in that youth group. And um, this is a synagogue that we used to go to. We used to call it gremlins. I don't know why, because maybe the ears, it reminded me of ears. So it's a synagogue that we used to go to. This is the view from the park that we used to play at a lot. And as you can see, a lot of mountains, a lot of green. <coughs> Sorry. And this is a park that we used to go to after Friday service at home. Shabbat night was like very important. The meal would last three hours. Sometimes it was so long, my friends would knock on the door because we wanted to go out afterwards for a walk in the neighborhood and we would still be sitting there and talking because my dad liked to make a ceremony out of it. And it wasn't just about the food and eating and leaving. We had to ask to be excused from the table. There were very strict rules 
and uh, little tiny ceremonies of every process of that meal. But in the end, I ended up going and walking around with everybody else and playing in the park. So that was a big uh, fun uh, thing that I love doing on Friday nights. So this is what I did on Friday nights. This is what I did on Shabbat. And does anybody know what these are? <coughs> it's very relevant to what's happening tomorrow night. It's the sukkah. Uh, so this is a special balcony. And in Hernov, nobody would be able to sell or rent an apartment if it didn't have a milpeset sukkah. Milpeset means balcony. And sukkah is just this preparation. So this is all year round. And then all they do is get the schach, which is the covering that you put on top in Sukkot. And uh, then you have a sukkah, like it's already almost done. All you need to do is get the cloth around and get the schach and of course decorate it. But um, it would be really hard to have a house without one of these if you lived in Hanof, because otherwise you would have to have it on the ground, which some people do, like we're gonna do in the synagogue on Friday, but it's not very convenient. So this is something you would see quite a lot in houses in Hanof. So this is Halnof and this is the neighborhood. And um, I'm gonna show a little bit of my favorite places in Jerusalem other than Halnof, but I'm gonna go a little bit of the history of Halnof and where this um, neighborhood actually was built on and what kind of atmosphere was around it because of that. And so, um, Harnoff was actually, and it's, it's relevant because I want to show perspectives from both ends. So Harnoff was built on a land that was called Dir Yassin. And uh, I actually remember this because in Sukkot, my dad used to take us camping um, for the whole time of Sukkot, instead of doing a sukkah in the house, uh, because we had no um, balcony with a sukkah. So we had to actually build a sukkah. So instead of just having it outside the house and going and coming back, because we couldn't eat in the house, we had to eat in the sukkah and sleep in it because we were supposed to sleep in it as well. So we just camped the whole eight days. And where we used to camp is usually, was usually in this place over here, this picture on the left, which is called Dir Yassin, And it's by actually a mental hospital that's called Kfar Shaul. And uh, this is where we used to do our camping. And um, I do remember one of the mental uh, patients actually called us and asked if we are homeless and we have no place to sleep because they didn't understand why we were there for eight days. But my dad didn't hide the fact that uh, this place was built on a land that used to belong to Arab people that lived in Dir Yassin, and there was a big massacre in 1948. So he thought it was important for us to be educated about that. And um, that's why I'm saying it. And this is another really important kind of fun place that my brother and I used to go play. Uh, it was like, our, we used to call it the forbidden land, but there are actually remains from the period of the second temple. And uh, as you can see, it, it indicates that it was a very, very um, um, prosperous uh, place, uh, even at that time. And there's also remains of a fortress that they had over there from the Herodian time. So, so much culture, so much history in this place. Uh, every stone has some kind of um, legacy and, and memory. And when you walk there, you really do feel it. At least I did. I, I remember even as a child seeing these places and playing and seeing the synagogue just beside the ruins. And uh, we had a little tree house over here. And it is uh, just a very, very um, intense, uh, place where you feel a lot of intensity from all way around. Uh, so yeah, some of my favorite places in Jerusalem, I decided to start with the Shuk, where my grandparents from my dad's side used to live. Actually, they still have a house there. Uh, my uncle lives there. It's just above the Pita place. So just above this Pita place, there are some steps <laughs> over there and the apartment is the top floor. Uh, so this is a place that has a lot of memories for me. Um, one especially 
that when I was a child, I used to get five shekels, which was a lot of money at the time. Now it's like a dollar, but it used to be a lot of money and used to tell me to go and get a bag of pitas. And then with the change, I could go and get whatever candy I wanted. So I loved going to my grandparents just so I could get myself some candy in a bag and get myself a drink or whatever. I had enough with the cash that was left or the coins that were left from the pita bread. Everything was fresh, lots of colors, lots of smells, lots of noise, lots of people, lots of pushing. <laughs> it's chaotic, but it's amazing. It's so colorful. The pictures here don't even do it justice. It's just a magnificent place. If you've never been, this is highly recommended to go to the Shuk. It's an, a real authentic experience. It's not trying to produce something. It's just, it's the real deal. It really is unique and it has amazing food from so many different places, um, uh, more authentic food, but also restaurants and also cheese and breads and anything you can imagine. And it became a little bit hipstery uh, nowadays. So you see a lot of hipsters there, but uh, it never used to be. When I was younger, it was more of a traditional kind of market uh, with spices and meat and all of that. And this is where my father also had his butcher shop. So this is the same place, a shuk. And the second place that is very important, of course, is my grandparents on my mother's side. They lived in the German colony. So my mother made Aliyah after she met my father in that Schnatt Shirut that she did in the kibbutz. And um, quite a little bit later, I would say probably 10 years or a little bit more than that, my grandmother decided to make Aliyah. So my mother was the first in her family. After that, her uh, sister came and also her mother and late after that her father when he was almost touching 90 he came to Israel to live to make Aliyah yeah should have gotten an award for making Aliyah at the latest age uh, that I've ever heard of uh, so this is a German colony it is a very very special place as well everything's built with a Jerusalem stone it is beautiful it really looks like you're walking in one of these um tiny little places, uh, almost in Greece or in Rome. It, it's really, really nice. The German colony is beautiful. It has a very uh, interesting um, aspect of the um, Jerusalem experience, I would say. Uh, not as religious as um, Harnoff or the Shuk. Uh, these are more mixed neighborhoods. So you see a lot of mixed families and a lot of mixed people in this type of uh, area, a German colony. Uh, but it is beautiful. And they even have um, a little tiny cemetery that is for Jews who believe in Jesus. So that's how diverse this place is. It's, it's very diverse. And you see lots of different types of people. Um, also lots of restaurants and cafes. Uh, yeah, very, very um, fashionable, I would say, this place. But the only downside, I would say, is that my grandmother still doesn't speak Hebrew. Uh, in the German colony, there are a lot of Anglos that live here. So there isn't a lot of push to speak Hebrew. So uh, they didn't really need it for survival or for being connected because a lot of these stores actually the people speak English and they're mostly Anglo-Saxons. Uh, in Hanoff, there were a lot of Anglo-Saxons but there were also a lot of Israelis. So it was more mixed here. I would say that a lot of them were Anglos. And the third place is where I went to school ninth grade when I told you I left Hanoff. It was, a, this is the place, it's called Evelina de Rothschild. It's a girl's school and it was in the city center. So this is what the city center looks like. It is also a very popular place. If anybody goes to Jerusalem, they usually go to the city center. Um, there is a train now that crosses there and this is Nahalat Shiva, very popular street. This is a Zion Square. Um, the reason why I'm going to talk about these, uh, you're going to see later, they are kind of relevant to my life. Uh, I spent a lot of time in the Zion Square. It was an outlet for a lot of religious kids that kind of don't find themselves so much in the system. Um, as I mentioned before, my father passed away when I was in grade nine. So I stopped going to school. I kind of had a identity crisis. I didn't really know if I want to be um, a Datilumi. I didn't know if I want to be more religious, less religious. Who am I? What am I? Why is this happening to me? So this is where I found a lot of comfort and a lot of kids that were in my shoes. 
Some of them wanted to leave religious neighborhoods. Some of them wanted to leave their parents' house. Uh, some just were looking and seeking for identity like every teenager does. So this is a very special place for me too. Um, I spent a lot of time here, so <laughs> yeah. After that, I would have to say the old city. And this is probably the most popular place in Jerusalem, uh, the Western Wall, the Golden Dome, Zion Mountain, um, the church, the Holy Specular, uh, the Muslim Quarter. Uh, we have also the uh, Christian Corner. So there's everything. Here, there's absolutely everything in such a small, compressed geographical area that you cannot not feel something when you go there. Um, not talking about crazy Jerusalem syndrome, but everybody that goes there feels something. It's, you can cut the tension with a knife, even on a nice day uh, where there is no riots, which is kind of rare because I don't think I've ever went there when there wasn't some kind of small incident going on. Uh, you see a lot of this, which is a nun and army guys and Arab guys. You see everybody and everything there. But it is absolutely amazing. It is the holiest place for the three monotheistic religions in the world. So obviously it is important to lots of people and you need to try to be respectful to all of them. And it's very sensitive and very delicate. Um, I actually went to the Golden Dome even though sometimes you're not really supposed to go, um, but I did and I, I also visited the, the Christian corner. I, I go to all these places and I never felt threatened really I feel comfortable going even if there are some situations that it's better to avoid going to these places but I still believe that you should go and if you ever go to Israel I highly recommend going to these places all of them and really really taking the whole day of only going to the old city and the reason why this is also very important to me is because I got married in the Zion Mountain my first marriage <laughs> And my son's Brit was in the Kotel, the yeshiva, the yeshiva of the Kotel. My brother-in-law was um, the manager of that uh, yeshiva. So we actually uh, did his Brit, his circumcision here. And uh, it was um, a beautiful yeshiva. And on the top of it, on the roof, you can see this view. Like it's that beautiful. It's absolutely gorgeous. Uh, one second. Uh, so yeah, that is the three, probably the three most important places for me, other than Halamok that I grew up in, um, the Shuk, uh, the city center and the old city. Um, and there is one more that I find very special. It's called Hadassah in Karim. It's a hospital, but it's actually also a neighborhood. And some of you might know the sisters Hadassah. Um, and uh, it is important for me because I was born there. My son was born there. And uh, also I did one year of national service in this place, exactly this building. And uh, it was about 15 minutes from the house that we moved to from Halnoff. So after my father passed away, um, my mother decided to leave that neighborhood. And we moved to a neighborhood that was very close to Hadassah and Kalim. It was called Ramat Shalet. And it was about five minutes from here, up here. So when I went to uh, the national service, it was pretty close. It was about 15 minute uh, by bus. Um, so yeah, this is a very, very special place for me as well, Hadassah. Um, I had a really good year here. I enjoyed it. I asked for a transfer from uh, the military uh, because of personal reasons um, that I still don't feel very comfortable talking about. Uh, it was too difficult for so many um, different reasons. Uh, the military experience is something that I don't wish upon anybody, and which is probably the main reason many of others that I'm going to share with you for wanting my son not to have to go and serve, uh, even though I do believe that it's important to serve our country. Don't get me wrong, but I don't want him to have PTSD. So um, the other place, um, is where I lived as a mother. So I had my son at 20, um, quite young, just after the service. And uh, we moved to this um, neighborhood that was just about 15 minutes from Jerusalem. Um, so it was pretty close, but it wasn't in Jerusalem. 
Uh, it's called Sobadasa. It's a town that's located in Jerusalem, but uh, it was about 15 minutes away. But it was only one kilometer away from the Green Line. Um, it was more affordable living than Jerusalem. You could get a little bit of a bigger house for the same price of a really tiny house in a not so good area in Jerusalem. That was one of the reasons we wanted to move there, but it is very close to an Arab village. And um, I will show you guys later what we had to go through every single day when we went to work and back. Uh, this is the place, it's gated, fully gated, and you have security, which is actually done by a security company, but also on the weekends, we had to rotate and um, guard the place as well. So there was an electric um, remote that you got. If you lived there, you could open it with a remote. Um, and if you didn't live there, you couldn't get in. So if you were visiting, you had to give a name and the, the guard would have to know in advance that this person is coming in to let you in because it was so close to different Arab villages. It was outside of the green line. And if some of you don't know what the green line is, I will try to explain that the best of my knowledge uh, in a little bit. So this was actually a, how would I call it, trempiada? It's like um, where you hitchhike, uh, which I did quite a bit because I only got my license in Canada. I never, I never drove in Israel. Uh, it's kind of uh, weird, I know, but there, there are lots of buses and Jerusalem is so crowded, there was never any parking. Anyway, it's really hard to find parking and uh, everything is very accessible to public transportation. Um, so I never felt the urge uh, until I moved here, which I felt like I didn't have legs if I didn't have a license, so I got it right away. Uh, but I used to take a lot of hitchhikes, uh, which is quite dangerous sometimes. So all of these are how to go on a hitchhike and be safe. Uh, because as you know, there's some kidnaps uh, in hitchhiking too. Um, so, the next few slides are probably the hardest ones, and I'm still not really sure if I need to talk about them or not, but these are some of the reasons uh, that I really wanted to uh, move. All the different things that I felt that were bubbling up since I was a kid, uh, since I was a child, not even uh, an adolescent. Like I really felt in grade three already the urge that I don't fit here, I don't belong here, something's bothering me about the way that this is going. And it just got stronger and stronger as I grew older until I made the decision to um, move. So I said this in the beginning, since this is focused more on the reasons why I moved, uh, it does seem a little bit more negative. Uh, so I really love Israel. I still miss Israel, not just my family, but also the place and the people and the atmosphere and the warmth. But um, the reasons why I wanted to move are these reasons that I'm going to share with you. So real Israeli, what is being really Israeli? Uh, Israeli, a lot of people call them sabal. Uh, sabal from the word sabra, sabres, which is like, a, um, um, what's it called? Yeah. Um, this plant that doesn't need much. It doesn't need a lot of water because it grows in a desert. And uh, it's kind of pointy and sp spiky, but inside it's very soft. And the fruit, if you ever had this fruit, it's delicious. It's very sweet and very red. So they say that the Israeli is kind of like that. He seems very aggressive in the outside. He seems very prickly, but in the inside is very soft and mushy. Uh, so they chose this to symbolize Israel. It's like a cactus, a big, huge cactus. Sabal, and this is in the beginning when they came to settle the country. So that's the way they used to look. Obviously, they don't look like that anymore. Uh, this is a very popular children book. This is a kind of a, a sitcom uh, that everybody grew up on watching at some point. And this is a very popular singer. The reason why I'm showing this is because I never grew up on any of these icons. And they're very, very important in the Israeli culture. Uh, at least from what I saw, a lot of people were talking and quoting this movie. Everybody was listening to him in the car, in the house, um, the real Israeli. So I didn't really, really feel that I was Anglo because I was born in Israel, but I didn't really feel like I was Israeli because my parents didn't uh, raise me on these uh, themes and on these type of uh, cultural references uh, necessarily. Uh, 
Um, so, so yeah, so that's where I felt in the beginning that this is not exactly my home. My home looks different than everybody else's home around me. Uh, their parents are slightly different than my parents. Uh, so it, it started there. And uh, all this deal of Sephardi and Ashkenazi, um, my mother's family not coming to visit us ever, ever at home because she married my father that was a Sephardi. Um, that bothered me a lot. Um, the schools that they had different prayer times for different uh, Sephardim and Ashkenazim, not one united um, book that they were reading from. It was divided. And then you went to a different place to read your version if you were not reading the version that they were reading that day. I didn't like that atmosphere of segregation because of um, you being white, you being slightly brown, you being Ashkenazi, you being Sephardi, it, it bothered me. Now, I know that this is something that the Israeli culture was working on and not only, but a lot. Um, if some of you have ever heard of the Black Panthers, obviously it didn't start in Israel, but there was a movement that took the name Black Panthers from the original Black Panthers. And they were trying to really push towards uh, social equality and having no differences between uh, the two main places where Jewish people came to Israel from, because there was a big divide between people that fled from the Second World War and the people that moved from different parts of Morocco, Algier, um, Iran, Iraq, and so forth. Uh, so yeah, so um, I even heard, I remember hearing this in the bus stop when I was standing, uh, waiting for the bus to take me to grade uh, nine school. I heard somebody saying in Yiddish, which I still understood a little bit because my mom's family, like I said, they were from Poland and they spoke Yiddish. Also my mother's uh, mother, my grandmother uh, from Lithuania, they spoke Yiddish as well. So they said Valdechai and I understood what they were saying. And they were referring to a little kid there that was not acting well, but he was a Mizrahi. And I just found that very horrifying. Um, again, this was this one incident. I'm definitely not saying it about everybody, but these type of incidents that I heard and I felt and I didn't like, um, they bothered me a lot. Another thing that bothered me is where in the school I went to, um, usually politics is supposed to, tomorrow we have elections. Nobody knows what I'm going to vote. Yes, I, I I was an, a Canadian citizen a few weeks ago, two weeks ago, I had my ceremony so I can go vote. Uh, I'm very happy about that, a huge milestone uh, in my end. Um, it's only been a, a decade since I applied for immigration and 10 years later, I, my son and I were citizens. But um, long story short, nobody's asking me when am I voting and nobody's really gonna judge me for what I vote and that's what I like. And there, everybody had to know what you're voting. Everybody in school was asking you questions. What are your parents voting? What are they doing? The teachers, the kids. And my parents actually were not mainstream. Uh, my father was uh, more of a left wing, even though he was very, very religious, he was left wing. And um, that wasn't accepted. It was a very right wing neighborhood where I lived in and it wasn't accepted at all to the point that they could vandalize your things if they knew that about you. Uh, uh, so everybody in my school were more Mafdal, which is this national religious kind of party. I remember uh, the songs that they were singing and uh, they were really highly uh, trying to encourage everybody to go with the ideology of this uh, group. But my sisters, for example, they went to Bet Yaakov. Bet Yaakov, if any of you heard, um, it's more of a Haredi uh, upbringing. It's not a national religious. It's more of a anti-Zionist um, um, upbringing. So my sisters went there where they don't stand in Independence Day and they don't stand even on Veterans Day because they believe that Israel should be a Jewish law country only. Um, this guy, we the reason why I put it is because he was our neighbor. Arya Derry is actually the head of this party that was uh, part of the Black Panthers. They were also trying to create this equality between the Mizrahi and the Ashkenazi. 
at the time where they felt that it was the worst in the early 90s. Uh, so, um, yeah, another reason why I'm saying that is because uh, I remember when I was a kid and there was a really, really big, huge bombing in one of the mosques. Uh, this guy that did it, Bauch Wolstein, um, some people were clapping hands and they were saying that he's a hero. Now, this guy killed women and children in the mosque. Uh, obviously, there's also the other side and there are terrible things happening from both ends. But this is something that I remember not wanting to clap hands and not wanting to stand and not wanting to participate in any of it. And I didn't want to feel like I was different, but I was, I was different um, because I, I was a minority. Uh, and I didn't feel very comfortable being a minority in that situation and setting. Uh, so that was one reason, the Ashkenazi versus Sephardi and the Muslim and the Jewish. Another one is this, these are the type of signs that I was always bombarded with. Um, the synagogue, obviously, there was a woman and men, and there was a separate entrance for the synagogue for women and men, and the women were behind a veil, so you couldn't see them. Um, and that's okay, that's the type of synagogue there is, but it came in buses. Uh, it came in street neighborhoods where women had to go around and there were always uh, people warning you that if you're not dressed modestly enough, uh, they had these almost like a police, um, so they were uh, watching and, and checking if you're wearing uh, appropriate clothing, otherwise they would shame you and sometimes chase you down the street and throw things at you. So. I didn't like that there wasn't any um, equality between men and women, gender. Uh, that really bothered me as well. I always wanted to learn like my brother and I wanted to analyze the, the Talmud and I wasn't allowed to study it and it bothered me too. And my father, it bothered him. So he used to teach me whatever I wanted to know. Uh, so that is another reason that I didn't like. Probably the most significant one is that um, I experienced way, way, way too many bombings in buses. It was a really, really hard time in the 90s, late 90s, early 2000s. It was a really, really horrifying time in aspect of uh, suicide bombers. There were so many of them in all these places that I showed you before in the shuk, in the city center, uh, in the buses, bus routes that I used to take, um, in Harnoff, in, in the synagogue in Harnoff, uh, just where my best friend lived. Um, so all of these that scarred me as a person and would scar anybody that had to be in these situations and lose people that they loved and see and hear and feel things that they shouldn't. Um, so that's obviously uh, a big, huge factor of me not wanting to participate and be where both ends are being hurt. It's just everybody's suffering. It's not that there is somebody that's right and somebody that's wrong. There's just people suffering, in my, in my opinion. Uh, and this is all in a very small geographical area. Of course, there are much, much more. These are just the ones where, that were very significant for me. Um, and yeah, so I, I said that the chapter about the service I'm not gonna talk about, I'm gonna skip that one. But this is me as a mother. So I showed you where we lived in Suodasa, and this is what we had to go through every day to get to Suodasa. So we had to go through something that is called a machsom, a checkpoint, I guess. Here, a lot of times there would be lots of cars. Um, I remember twice that uh, there were shootings before us. And I used to tell my son to go underneath the seat. He used to think it's a game. Um, he now knows it wasn't a game. Um, it was just for his safety. Uh, but this is part of what we had to go through every single day to see these. Um, and it is, some people call this the apartheid, the segregation, but this is basically the West Bank barrier. And these are the tunnels that they made so you don't have to go through this. So it's a little bit safer through the tunnels. Um, we call it Gader Afrada, separation gate. Um, they used to throw uh, rockets and stones. So they built this all across and the tunnels. And it leads from Jerusalem to this place, Tzoradasa, that we used to live in. 
So this is what we have to go through. And after a few times that I put my son through that and the rockets, I kind of said, okay, we're gonna immigrate so he doesn't have to go to the army and he doesn't have to feel these threats uh, ever. And um, he does remember because we moved here when he was 10. So he still remembers. Uh, he did think it was fireworks when he was younger, but afterwards he realized it were, they weren't fireworks. Uh, that's what I try to tell him, but he knew I was just lying. And uh, we really had to decide if we were gonna stop the car in the middle or if we're going to continue what is safer. Um, and uh, there was one time when we went to the beach and we were stuck in the middle of the ocean and we couldn't get shelter. We couldn't get back to the, um, to the, to the shore on time. So we just decided that we're gonna dunk and we're gonna kind of dive underneath in case it comes closer. Luckily, nothing happened. Uh, he still remembers it as an adventure and something to remember, but these, events led me to think that I really don't want to live in that country um, with all its amazing things, but these were the things that I didn't want him to have to grow up with. Uh, so those are probably the, the main ideas of why I wanted to move. And now you could say you could have moved outside of Jerusalem. Probably half of the Israelis that moved here don't have these experiences as bad. Um, but for me, all I knew in Israel is Jerusalem. I couldn't even imagine moving to Haifa or Tel Aviv or any other place. Um, it was easier for me actually to think about leaving to another country than to move outside of Jerusalem. Uh, it sounds kind of odd, but that's just the reality of, of where I was at and I don't regret it. So this is the green line. And as you can see, all the villages are kind of swollen I was trying to think of a good way to describe this and um, because of all these residential schools that uh, have popped up and uh, I know that a lot of the reserves are in Canada, it's almost like the same thing, only it's more hostile because they still have the resentment of us conquering the country. So there's a lot of, of bad vibes and bad feelings and bad blood there. Not with everybody, but with some. And sometimes all you need is those few extremists to make everybody feel uncomfortable. Uh, so this is basically the reality that you live in. And um, there really isn't any solution. Not that I see, not now, and don't know if ever, really. Uh, so that is uh, the major reasoning for me wanting to move. Um, this is just a picture because I wasn't sure that a lot of people understand the different streams of religious. There are so many different streams of religious. And this is just a chart that describes the different type of percent that each religious group belongs to has. So it's not only about being uh, religious versus secular. There are so many within the religious uh, that are different and they don't agree with each other. And they don't, it's like the joke that for every two Jews there are two synagogues. And it really literally was like that from my experience. Uh, so Ashkenazi, Sephardi, Chiloni, Dati, Zionist, non-Zionist, left wing and right wing, Jewish and Muslim, Israeli, Palestinian, too many things. I just wanted my son to have to worry about closing the garbage because raccoons come and uh, maybe deer that are gonna jump in front of me in the car when I drive in a really dirt road in the middle of the night. But an equal, very accepting, uh, amazing uh, community that I feel that Canada has been for me, very inclusive. Um, I stepped and I started working at the Y. And uh, when I came in 2016, uh, it's probably faith. I can't really describe it in any other way. It's just my destiny. All the Syrian response, the great Syrian response that uh, Justin Trudeau gave, and they all landed in St. John in the same hotel, the Howard Johnson that I was staying at in the same time that I came. When I woke up in the morning, the second day I was in Canada, I was surrounded by Muslims with hijabs, and I didn't understand where I was at. And I felt that this had to be for some kind of reason. And um, I felt so privileged that I have the language and I have the culture, the Western culture, and I can survive here and I can get a job here. And I felt so sad for these people. And I decided that this is my true calling to work with them, to help them, to help newcomers, 
to help newcomers that are Muslim so they see me as a person and they get to know me. And when I reveal that I'm Jewish and I'm Israeli, they won't care. And um, it actually happened. Uh, sorry, I'm getting emotional. But um, yeah, I, I worked with people. And after five years, I told them and they hugged me. And for me, that is why I moved here. And I hope my mom will forgive me. Uh, I never meant to mock her existence, but we all just want our kids to live in a place where they feel welcomed and they feel good and they feel that it's right. And sorry, I wasn't planning on getting so emotional, but um, yeah, I did feel that uh, in Israel, uh, I couldn't, I couldn't be myself. I couldn't go to the army and still hug somebody that's wearing um, a kafia, and I couldn't be religious without being considered disrespectful for the secular. And um, here, I just felt that I can be whatever type of religion I want, and I can be whatever gender, and I can be no gender, and um, everything will be okay. And and it is okay. I mean, it's hard and I miss my family, especially during the holidays. Mm. Uh, apologize again, I'm gonna drink water and relax. Yeah, I wasn't expecting that, but uh, yeah, um, this is basically my story and the reason why I moved here and I feel that I have a lot of meaning in my job and I'm helping people with this transition that is not easy. And even though I have somewhat of the culture, I still don't understand the little nuances and uh, I find it very challenging at times to understand what people expect from me and want from me. But I am not shy to say, I don't understand, help me or reach out to somebody that seems like they know what's going on a little bit more than me. So. Uh, that is basically my story, and I really, really hope I didn't offend anybody by saying anything. Again, this is my experience. Many people would have different experiences. My sisters have different experiences. That's why they're still in Israel. Uh, my brother is actually moving. Uh, he's not staying in Israel in, in a month. He's leaving. Uh, he's moving to England just because it's a little bit quicker than going all the way to Canada and getting a lawyer like I did. Um, so yeah, so he's moving there. Um, so he obviously shares similar views to me, but my two sisters are very, very Zionist and so is my mom. Uh, and I apologize for my outbreak, but that's it. I wanted to thank you as well for sharing your memories and your experiences and having the courage to do this. Um, I don't think we realize the diversity. Um, if we're not familiar with Israel, to realize that there are so many different kinds of neighborhoods and so many different kinds of Jewish people that, you know, when we look at the St. John community, like everybody's Ashkenazi, everybody came from Lithuania, almost everybody. So, you know, it was much more homogenous, I guess, than what we would see if we were in Israel. And, um, We'd like to thank you for doing that and for coming to St. John and being part of the community. And so I don't know if Anne or Leslie or Karen or Barb have any questions or comments they would like to make. Um, Leslie as well was originally from St. John and she did live on a kibbutz for 20 years. So 